It's the Bird Emergency. Hello, 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 bird nerds. I'm Grant Williams. This is the show where I get to speak to really clever people who are studying and unlocking the secrets of really amazing birds. And the entry criteria is that they're kind of endangered, threatened, critically endangered. And today we're back in the Southern Hemisphere today. I'm speaking with Dr. Ursula Allenberg, who is a penguin person. Hello, Ursula. Thanks for joining me. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, Grant. It's good to meet you finally. I only know you via Twitter. Um, uh, yeah, the well... penguinologist. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, sorry, I was I was just laughing and and thinking. Oh no, she's read my Twitter feed. She's seen my she's seen my ranty Twitter feed. <laughs> I do occasionally when I get distracted. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me where whereabouts are you located? We, we I, mentioned New Zealand, the long white cloud, but um, you're not you're not up in uh, Auckland and the and and the Sea Petrel Gulf area, are you? No, no, we're down south, Southern Girl down in uh, Dunedin, and um, we're kind of working around the Southern South Islands and the Southern Arctic Islands. So we miss out on the, that terrible storm, luckily. Um, but yeah, we have other things to deal with down here. So it's bloody cold, actually. Do you want to want to see? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're yes, back in it's, winter. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the middle of summer and you have a lap rug. Uh, that's fantastic. <laughs> That's so New Zealand. It's that fits all the cliches. The only thing you haven't done is said, said "Hey, bro." Or uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, uh, Ursula, tell us a little bit about the the habitat that the penguin that we're going to be discussing, the Tawaki. How's my pronunciation? Tawaki is perfect. Yeah, Tawaki. 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 So, um, or never Tawaki. It's a yeah. Tawak. Tawak. Uh, what we knew about this bird uh, in bird books when I was growing up is that it was called the Crested Fjordland Penguin. Is that yeah. the, the old name? So, yeah. Is that how, how you refer to, to the bird now in scientific literature? Or has the Maori name been widely accepted in general communication? I guess we're making it more more popular. Um, it's like the official Fjordland crested penguin. It's quite lengthy and a mouthful. And Tawaki is unique. Everybody, you know, um, it's it might not be the big seller because calling yourself the Tawaki Project and not have penguin in there, people miss you, you know. Like so, we we dropped that code word penguin to draw people in from around the world. But I hope by talking more about Tawaki. Um, you people start to care about them because he's not a penguin like any other penguin. They're they're very special, unique um, penguins. And you t you asked me about the habitat. Um, we've just been uh, over there, it's coming back now um, to Malt, uh, and you go. It's quite rugged and remote. Um, imagine yourself kind of crawling. You've been to Milford. You've seen Milford, for example, if you picture Fjordland. These really uh, steep fjord we, We've falls. all seen pictures. We've all seen yeah. pictures of Milford Sound. Come over, man. It's it's you, it's you, you need to see it in life because it's, it's still after so many years. It's breathtaking being in these these deep fjords. You have these sheer walls that drop down um, hundreds, uh, thousands of meters actually, and um, waterfalls and things. And in between there little um, nooks and crannies, um, old boulder fields where um, now um, ancient forest grows on top. And it's a tangle in several stories. So imagine it's like a um, yeah, multi-story apartment with these thick roots and um, old moraine boulders. And Tawaki, they don't nest like other penguins and, and big colonies. They're kind of tucked away uh, in in these and in, in between these old moraine boulders and tree root caves so you get down on your tummy and crawl and dis i need to send you some pictures like you you, you disappear in in that network of old moraine boulders and it it requires some guts uh, to work with tawaki because then you turn a corner and kind of follow your nose you feel a bit wild and you smell oh there's penguin you know and then you go turn turn a corner and then you have your tawaki nesting in a, in a little um 
a beautiful nest bowl with a few sticks, decorated stones, and looking after um, their fluffy chicks, hopefully. And um, then you can go take, yeah, another nest um, you can count. One of the things I noticed when looking through the website is that there's a lot of fallen timber in the in the environment so there's lots of old trees decaying trees and whatnot mm. and and let's set the scene for people who uh, aren't whose only experience of penguins perhaps is through david attenborough kind of shows and whatnot you mm. have you have penguins that nest on, on ice flows and on mm. beaches mm -hmm. and and incubate eggs basically on the feet of one parent mm. keeping it off the ground. Mm. Then then you have penguins that excavate their own burrows and our little penguin in Australia is like that and mm -hmm. the New Zealand little penguin or how do we say that? A hoi, hoi ho? No, no, oh no, the hoi ho is the yellow-eyed penguin. Uh, it's the kurara. So you just ah. if you listen because uh, Maori used uh, you know describe how they they're, they're calling it, you know the kia you know kia or kaka like these uh, famous um, parrots um, the korora and you've heard uh, probably a little penguins calling in Melbourne you know just off the pier when they're coming back they have these contact calls go quack quack and then they come and have this mutual display and go korora korora and so that's that's your korora. Um, and uh, the hoi ho is the noise shouter. It's more like a very high pitched. Um, I shouldn't do that. Are we live? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, it, it, this is the most enter entertaining part of the discussion. Yeah, exactly. um, the, <laughs> but the, uh, I, 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 I got off the track a little bit. It, yeah, that's uh, how for, for a change. But the yeah. the, the, the tawaki is is different in that it's not but it's not a burrower and it's yeah. not nesting on ice flows like the antarctic and the subantarctic penguins but i was curious when i was looking at all the photos of the habitat and these birds poking their heads up from fallen logs and whatnot do they make use of things like uh, hollows and crevices that naturally occur when trees fall over each other and spaces are, are left and like you mentioned that these beaches or these hillsides are, are formed by boulders that were expelled from volcanic eruptions you know. no no that's all no? glacial glacial oh boulders. it's all it's all gla it's, it's, it's all glacial yeah. rub glacial yeah. ru rubbish that yeah. carved out from from the mountains okay so uh, do the penguins utilize those crevices or do they like you said, there's a nest bowl that they decorate. Do they have have to have a clear space? How? What do they need? Oh, it's it's like a like a hobbit hole. You know, you go. They they find these nice, dry, um, lovely spaces between old moraine boulders or in tree root caves, and then they make it them their own. You know, they they excavate it a bit more and make a lovely nest bowl and move in, make a cozy, bring that one leaf, you know, and uh, put it somewhere and um, just own it. And then they shit all over it. And um, <laughs> that's how you find them, you know, following your nose. <laughs> are, are they utilising their um, renovator's dream to, uh, to, to uh, anthropomorphise them? Are they, mm. are they utilising these nest scrapes or or mm. clearings or whatever they've made for themselves all year round or are they disappearing out to sea for extended periods what, what yeah, no, what's absolutely. the life, what's the what's the annual cycle of a uh, mm. of a tawaki okay a, a tawaki currently um they just came back to malt um, which means where they um they fatten up during their pre-malt journey um which they just the last, you know, over the last six weeks, they've been all the way down to the subarctic front, some 2,500 case, like a six kilometer, a 6,000 kilometer round journey. And um, and now they come back weighing twice the weight, can barely walk, you know, they go up the beach, are humongously fat and fall a few times over and then lock themselves into the forest and find a, a nice little 
um, nook where they can can hide from the weather, but still have access to some drinking water and um, some wind when the sandflies get to pestering and shed all their feathers at once. So that most birds will lose a feather here and there during their um, annual cycle. Penguins, they kind of, they need a dive suit. You know, it's like if you imagine um, a penguin, uh, penguin feathers being more like scales and thousands of them overlapping um, each other, they form that dive suit. And once they have holes in that dive suit, they don't like to, to swim in that cold ocean. So they need to fatten up first, go ashore, shed all their feathers which is called a catastrophic molt and it looks catastrophic it's, it looks like a kind of a firecracker and a down pillow experiment going wrong and uh, some people get really worried about it because they look really shitty but the best you can do is leave them in peace when they're um in that stage because they need all their energy they don't need to be um freaked out they need all that energy all that fat half of their body weight gets metabolized into these new feathers and then in another two or three weeks, they um, they have this shiny new dive suit. They um, take for a spin around the fjord, fatten it a bit, oil it another couple of days to make it really shiny. And then they take off on a more leisurely, maybe four to five months um, uh, winter migration, where they head again down to the, the uh, subarctic um, front um, and uh, hang out. Like, uh, it's it's not... It's it's they actually if you picture it they go now since we've worked on them we know now they are going south and past Tasmania further west um, so you can stand on the shores of Tasmania wave them as they pass and find a really cool spot for um, fattening up um, and preparing for the breeding season so back in the days when we started we had no idea we just knew they disappeared and then they would come back again. Um, so sometime uh, in late July, August, to set up a nest and start incubating. And um, they're winter breeders. So when we try to work with them, we actually have to, you know, battle snow down to sea level. And it's it's crazy. Um, so winter breeders, um, they set up shop, usually hatch their, their eggs in um, September, you know, and uh, mid-September, mid-October is kind of the key um, chick rearing period. And as they, the, you know, chicks hatch and are really fragile, like very fine down and need dad to look after them um, as as they, you know, grow because they can't thermoregulate themselves as, as they're really little. And mom's out foraging, like mom's the hunter in the family. So she's out foraging, bringing back um, food for the little one and poor dad starving on the on the nest and getting really thin again. But a proud, proud dad steps up and eventually um, the chicks get big enough to be left alone. And then both parents are out foraging and um, uh, feeding that chick until it's fat enough and ready to uh, um, learn what it takes to be a penguin during its first life a uh, year at sea. So many questions, but the first one: when when they're out when they're out at sea after they've molted, and when they go out to sea to fatten up, and they and they sort of hang a hang a shallow right turn at the at Tasmania, um, uh, are they still hanging around in a loose? Um, what, what do we call it? Would that be a flock or a school? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, or, or, or if they're on, if they're on top of the the sea, would it be a raft? What? Yeah, yeah. Actually, would you would call them uh, like little penguins come in as rafts, kind of find safety in numbers, and then as the night falls, they come and waddle across the beach quickly, so no eagle can pick them up or, and and eat them. Um, Tawaki don't have that that problem, so they. They do socialize in the fjords um, and have fun kind of going for a spin with three or four other mates. And actually, we've deployed um, um, the camera loggers uh, we recently developed. And last season had a really nice spin. I need to send you the link um, of uh, a girl taking off um, with a few of her girlfriends and um, just cry the sheer speed. They zoom through the water and you can tell they, they have fun before they go out um, and do the hard day's work uh, foraging and, and uh, feeding the family. But uh, out in, in the deep um, southern ocean, there's so so few Tawakis. Um, they kind of all uh, take the general same general direction. 
but um, I, they they they'll be pretty solitary. There might be um, a couple hanging out together, but we, we're talking about so few birds. They're not going out in, in, a, in a big um, big team. Um, they spread out. That that means I must ask the question: What's the yeah. estimated population, and how reliable do you think that? population count is okay um the initial when we started um, with our project um the official count was five to seven thousand birds and um then we started looking and we saw so many more um then uh, it was mind-boggling actually because those are counts fjordland or um the west coast they are really difficult places to get, get around and um, uh, there's been a, a fantastic uh, work in the early 90s um, by McLean and, and colleagues to go and try to get to a population estimate. And um, for example, uh, we have one person on the team, you might, might know Robin Long, um, daughter of the Long family, a raising New Zealand's remotest family. Um, she grew up with Tawaki in her backyard. And um, she... Uh, yeah, so uh, like back in the days when she was little, it took them three days to get out there. Now she runs the 50 k's or so to, to her uh, family home in, in a day with a light pack. But um, she started counting um, penguins on the West Coast and uh, those same areas that McLean and, and um, people counted. And in that one example, uh, um, McLean searched with four people for two days and found some, and I need to look up the numbers, some uh, 40 something uh, penguins and uh, nests. And then Robin uh, came in and uh, kind of, it, it looks like as if over the last 10 years, the population would have dramatically increased. You know, it's, it's really, she found every, every year she went back in to search for nests, she found more because she, um, she reckons it took her about five years to learn where to look and how to find them and now over the last couple of years the numbers have stabilized at 370 pairs roughly so that's ten tenfold of what we initially thought was there so we're at the very beginning we we don't really know how many there are exactly but we can say there's a lot more than we thought there would be so um and that's and that's, that's amazing news um that we actually have a penguin species especially crested penguins they're really struggling declining we lost of the um, rock hopper penguins more than 90 percent of the population and here we have a penguin the tawaki that's doing exceptionally well and it's just uh, you know so reassuring mind you they still need a lot of help because they nest too close for comfort um to people uh to like People are often the problem for wildlife, as you know, Grant. But um, they're doing much better than we thought. And um, I think you got to celebrate that good news. Definitely. It's, it's not that often that we hear uh, good news when, <laughs> when we talk about uh, endangered rare birds. It's generally the other way around. For birds that spend much of their life at sea, one of the great um, threats causing mortality is fishing. Mm. Now, is that a problem for Tawaki? And let's let's broaden it out to um, the New Zealand penguins in general. Um, it's like penguins are pursuit um, divers, so they they go and follow their prey. Um, and thus uh, they they won't be going on long lines. They're, like there's one example of a penguin being foul hooked through a flipper accidentally, but it's not like the albatross that die um, being hooked on long lines. Penguins drown in nets and particularly in gill nets or set nets as we call them here on New Zealand. Um, they're they're a, a huge problem, particularly for the yellow eyed penguin and we don't quite know how much of an impact it has on Tawaki, but any net that is in a, uh, a Tawaki foraging area will catch Tawaki and uh, there are records of Tawaki being caught in set nets. Um, Tawaki like during the breeding season, like just like they have some preferences and they like to forage 
quite coastal, quite close to these kelp forests. And that means anybody is going, for example, for butterfish um, would potentially um, catch tawaki as well. So is there is there a large part of their, um, both their molting range and their, um, you know, their, their foraging range? Because they, they, have, they have two um, sort of, two parts of the year, don't they, where they're feeding close to shore for part of the year and then for part of the year they're heading off to the to the subantarctic. So uh, are, are they often frequently in in places where um, gill netting is common or uh, are they and is it close to shore is is the problem for the netting a a New Zealand problem or is it, it an it international is. problem? <laughs> No, and in, in, in fact, for our penguins, it's very much a New Zealand problem that we need to manage. And should, it should be easier when you think about it, because internationally, um, uh, it's much harder. But for example, the yellow-eyed penguin, they are um, just occurring in New Zealand. So you'd hope, you know, that is something we, we can, yeah, make happen, make their life easier. Jacinta, <laughs> but, that, Jacinta listen up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'd, we'd hope yeah uh, we have all the solutions we just need to get you know behind it and and make them implement them make make the sea a safer place for penguins but for tawaki i'm, I'm glad to report that along the west coast and in fjordland there's very little overlap so i think uh, set netting in the southern fjords and um, around Stewart island uh, will take the odd tawaki but at the moment it's not a threat for the entire um, population or, or species. Okay. Now, now for international listeners uh, who are not uh, New Zealanders, the, the the West Coast is is the bit that oh, is, fa <laughs> is, is facing uh, Australia, and the Fjordland is the other side that that faces out to the Pacific and and no and, no 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 no, no it's all, all on the West Coast. So it's we have all the West, the West Coast. What, it's all and, the West Coast. We have the West Coast, um, or we call the northern part of our West yeah. Coast, and then it drops into Fjordland, where you have these really deep fjords. Um, it's but it's still on the West Coast, and, and then, then it, as it comes around, and then Stewart, but Stewart Island's Island. round on round off the tip, sort of yeah, on the exactly. East Coast, isn't it? Okay, so so how far round? Um, so the the stronghold is on the. Um, west coast which is the when you're looking on on your at your school atlas children it's the bit facing australia and round to the bottom <laughs> but how far let's say around the corner uh do do they occur and do they nest any any further up the um up the east coast the pacific coast yeah so um, Tawaki um, have the most restricted breeding range, actually, just over a mere 500 kilometers. Um, and we had this year for the first time uh, since a long time, a, a nest um, in Bluff, actually. So all the way down really south. And we had back in the day some records where a, a pair attempted to breed on, on the East Coast. But um, they certainly molt here. So we have the first few Tawaki arriving um, around Otago currently um, and, and molt, hopefully finding a, a safe place away from, from humans and, and dogs where they can shed their feathers in, in peace. Um, but yeah, and, and uh, it's, it's a very restricted breeding range and yet extremely um, diverse marine habitat from what I call the West Coast, although you can argue Fjordland is also in the West. Um, the West Coast is kind of continental shelf. And then as you go drop down into Fjordland, you have these really deep fjords that as you leave the fjord, drop down in a, into a deep sea environment, like 2000 meters straight, straight away as you go out um, into the Tasman Sea. And then you go around Favor Strait, which is that little strait that separates Southern New Zealand the New Zealand South Island from Stewart Island. It's um, shallow coastal. It might be just you know, 40 meters deep where, and, and they don't forage very deep. They can forage deep if they want to, but why put effort in if there's good food uh, close to shore and in shallower areas? Totally. Uh, 
people will be familiar with um, Stewart Island, I think, if they are into rare birds and New Zealand birds, in that the kakapo is is also on Stewart Island. So is the uh, Tawaki and the kakapo, are they utilising similar habitats in that? in that part like uh, will, will you find will you be stepping over Tawaki nests and and at the same time maybe see a kakapo scurrying away or are the habitats completely different they, they are quite different i might add um stewart island currently doesn't have any kakapo on the main island it's on on finnaho or codfish island a ne- small yeah, kind of door. island yeah. island it's that's predator free because kakapo and predators introduce predators, well, they don't, well, they don't go that, along. Well, that, uh, that, <laughs> that was where I was going to go next. But let, let, let's talk about the differing habitats that they exploit, yeah. because because New Zealand's been very, very successful in marketing itself worldwide as a tourist destination. But I don't think people really know how diverse the different habitats are. The the wild places of New Zealand are mm. um, at and some habitats are extremely localized. So, so tell us about that that southern portion of the South Island. Yeah, oh, I might add a little anecdote actually, because I've um, came across a kakapo working with yellow-eyed penguins on Fenaho. So we were hiding and waiting for yellow-eyed penguins to return from their foraging trips, and um, my uh, field helper got really excited and heard, you know, I'm rattling and, and crashing around the forest. And it was his first night in the forest. And I was so envious because like, I, like, I think there's someone coming. It's like the wrong direction. You're heading like, look to the beach. It's like, oh, there's some, it's really big and it's right next to me. It's, like, oh, it's a kakapo. <laughs> it's like, what the hell? You know, I'm working here since decades. And he in his first night gets a kakapo walking over him as we're waiting for yellow-eyed penguins. It was amazing. So that really made made us night. The next nights were were less exciting, but just penguins. But they certainly hang around in these lower um, coastal um, forests, these podocarp forests, the the kakapo. Um, or they they prefer, uh, you know, they're spreading out across the entire island. They prefer um, the uh, the higher hilly areas when they do the, the males, especially when they do their booming and attracting mates. But they they can they can uh, um, you know they have feet. Uh, they might might be flightless those kakapo, but they can cover some distance. Yeah. Did, did you just refer to the forest as Potocarp Forest? Yeah, the lowland so, Potocarp so po- um, forest. So Potocarpus, so, uh, we're we're familiar with uh, with that genus here. Mm-hmm. Um, is is that the dominant? Uh, well, I'm assuming it's going to be the dominant. Um, tree in the in the forest but what what kind of like all of the photos that I've seen and on your website there's all these aerial roots like the trees have got these spread out aerial roots as well as fallen logs and and whatnot is that mostly podocarpus or is it a uh is it quite varied in the in the large flora it's incredibly diverse our, our forests over here so um, we have, you know, lots of, you know, for example, in Harrison Cove, where I've just been last weekend, um, there's a rock fall and it's been overgrown by pioneer fuchsia trees, um, which have, you know, these quirly, quirky roots ar- around um, these boulders from, from the rock fall. And um, there, there's, you know, again, or we, you have Kamahi and other um, beautiful old rata trees, you know, we have all sorts of very diverse trees and, and podocarps as, as a whole group of um, trees that are kind of just in, in that, um, yeah, in, in that group, but it's, it's, it's quite diverse as well and with different habitat requirements. Um, and uh, so you go through a West Coast forest and it's mind boggling, not only the trees, but, you know, all those different ferns and, and mosses and lichens you have there and little epifoots. It's uh, like growing uh, and down in different stories. And you have these fallen big giants, you know, a um, Todora might be fallen or an old rata tree. And then there's seedlings on top of it that start to grow and be big trees again. So it's it's a... Um, even in a, in a very small, you know, um, like a hectare, you have 
lots lots of different species um that uh, yeah it's nowhere uh, like it's uh, well, it's like it's hugely diverse you as a botanist um you know i think most people look at a like look at a forest or some greenery and say oh there's grass and shrubs and trees and other green shit and then you have a botanist <laughs> going in and going like wow and it's just popping out all these 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 crazy latin names and it's yeah it's i'm still learning and it's absolutely beautiful like you never get bored in that forest how familiar do you think the general new zealand public is with that really wild part of new zealand do they understand how complex and unique and amazing it is i think the the landscape is very much appreciated like these crazy fjords and waterfalls and and things and um, a few people would go and and be delighted about the diversity of ferns and other bryophytes, I imagine. But um, uh, I think there's great appreciation uh, for the beauty. Although if you if you're not you're not able to name different different ferns, you can still appreciate how different they look and how beautiful they are, and how decorative they are around a penguin nest, for example. Um, especially when you grow up, you know, and see all these penguin documentaries and big colonies, and then suddenly you have these elusive rainforest penguins that sneak, you know, on little hobbit pathways into the forest and um, hide behind some trees and some some ferns. That's probably a point worth worth exploring. That um, we are. I mentioned at, at the start that the day. All of the David Attenborough documentaries and all the recuts that have been done a million times over have got us very familiar with Antarctic and sub-Antarctic um, penguins. Uh, are New Zealanders familiar, do you think, with the the three mainland breeding uh, penguin and and what uh, I think is it thirteen species of penguin recorded in? In New Zealand, mm -hmm. or is it yeah. more? No, it's it's um, thirteen. If you depending on how you split them up, so um, I yeah, argue that, we okay. have Con controversy, penguins. controversy. <laughs> yeah, like like it, it, let, what what it's is the, the whole the, kettle, yeah? yeah. Well, but we, we, we've got time. We've got time to explore it. Let's uh, <laughs> let, let's talk about that. We've talked about three species: the yellow-eyed, the the crested fjordland, and the the little penguin. Now the little penguin in New Zealand is is a distinct species from the little penguin or fairy penguin as we were calling it here in 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 Australia. And sometimes they call them little blue penguins, don't they? I don't no, know. or just blue so, penguins just, because uh, they're so blue. Yeah, there's so many common names. It's just although you can uh, get confused, tawaki when they're freshly malted um, sport a very blue coat as well. So they're they so, can be so blue. You, so there's three species that breed mm -hmm. on the mainland. That's yes. correct, isn't it? Yes. But unless, we... unless you split the little penguins up and then you have four because I'd say we probably have two different little penguin species. One, the New Zealand um, little penguin. Um, that's around most of New Zealand and comparably less studied than um, the Australian little penguin that is mostly around Otago. So where I'm based, uh, most of the penguins are actually Aussies, like the little penguins. And as you go further north or around on the west coast, that's mostly the New Zealand, you can call them subspecies. They're probably pretty close to, um, or there's good arguments to make them two separate species, but um, I guess you can, it's all definitions. Like we don't, don't argue about it. It's from a management point of view. Um, yeah, we need to learn more uh, about the New Zealand little penguins because we already know quite a bit about the Australian well, um, species or subspecies. Surely someone's doing a PhD on the genetic work to, to split those species. I mean, there's a good paper oh, in that, isn't there? Yeah, no, it's already published, actually. Stephanie okay. Grosser has done that and argued for two species. Okay, which, uh, which camp do you do you uh, uh, reside in? Um, I'm I'm not too worried actually. It's species is just a convention, you know, and you can go with different definitions. Is it, is it a biological species definition or some other uh, species definition? But um, I think as long as they 
don't and you have different for example different ducks that all hybridize and interbreed and we still think they're different species you know but in mm -hmm. and, and that uh, they they hybridize very little like there's um as far as i know um they 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 breed quite separately so and the colonies uh around um Dunedin and Amaru it's um mostly um the Australian little penguin and over for example on the west coast we have um the New Zealand little penguin and i'd argue they they differ also um slightly in in um in in shape and size and you know some some habits um so for the uh, for example the australian little penguin is much more productive so they can lay a two sometimes even three clutches in a season um there's probably one record i think of a new zealand little penguin attempting a you know they do replacement clutches but actually raising two clutches is pretty unusual for little penguins um, for the New Zealand species or subspecies. So, um, which means they're more like they can't recover as fast from any disturbance as the the more robust uh, Australian counterpart could. And so I'm, I'm less worried about whether we call them different species. I'm more worried about what we do from a conservation management perspective, if we want to safeguard them we need to understand their um, biology and habitat requirements. And we need to learn a lot more about our actual, our New Zealand little penguins. Yeah. And there's good work being done at the moment, mostly by community groups all around New Zealand. A good old citizen scientist. Um, yeah, I love it. So we're, we're talking to Aki, but, but little penguins <laughs> are, are, are amazing. So just to extend that discussion a little further, if if those two populations of the subspecies or species, however we classify them, are quite distinct, uh, are they ecologically distinct as well? Do they occupy different niches within the environment or are, is one a functional replacement for the other in the different ranges? Um, I'd, I guess I, I would split it up even further because we have such diverse marine habitats around New Zealand that they um, have they play different roles in their different habitats and have um, you know if you're a, a little penguin in Motuara going into into the Favo Strait, you need to go way further and put a lot more work in to feed your family than you would uh, if you feed off Amaru, which is has very productive waters um, very close by. And so they they go um, for different different species have their different um, favorite foraging hotspots and things. And um, in terms of replacement, you know, we we could. Uh, I'm surprised. I'm, like after all these years, um, they haven't expanded further. Like they're quite localized. Um, our Aussie um, little penguins. They're still in Otago, so they. <laughs> They quite like it here, and they they're not kind of that invasive, ex expanding, um, crazy uh, conquistador of uh, penguins. They they live next to each other quite happily. So they're they're not the rainbow lorikeet of the penguin world. No. <laughs> um, I, 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 look, I, I probably was misapplying the terminology replacement and and whatnot, but but I get I guess what I was wondering about is. Although although they're foraging in different areas and they're not overlapping a lot, and the and the opportunities to forage are quite different because of the locations they're in, are they choosing different foods? Do we do we know that? Like, is the specialisation actually um, got down to their dietary requir requirements? I, I guess they are going uh, for what's there, you know, and whatever the habitat provides. And, and they need to be um, adaptable in our changing environments. Um, so they, uh, yeah, they, they do take um, a diverse uh, 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 prey range, but they like these small oily fish well, if they're available, because that's good for uh, raising, raising chicks. And high um, energy but, for the, yeah, for the exactly. amount of energy that they expend. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, as I say, we know comparably little about the New Zealand little penguins. So all our knowledge comes from Phillip Island, for example, and other really well-researched colonies around Australia. And then down here 
especially Omaru has been very, um, the Omaru blue penguin colony has been a very uh, research um, intensive and have, yeah, but again, they have the Australian um, species or subspecies. Well, that, that's, uh, uh, that's sort of surprising uh, to me. I mean, I, I don't know it's much about the pen- Aussies. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I, I don't know much about uh, penguins in New Zealand, obviously, because I've been labouring under the misapprehension that all the little slash fairy penguins in New Zealand were yours and that the odd straggler might turn up uh, no, no, from no. Australia. No, no, that's all Aussies here in Otago, um, Aussies rule. <laughs> <Aussie's rule. laughs> but if, which is funny actually because you'd expect the straggler arriving somewhere on the west coast but um they actually uh, established in omaru and uh, around the otago peninsula for example it would be really amazing to be able to examine the the fossil record and the the and and the the modern debris to to actually determine uh who brought them here? How, yeah, how it <laughs> happened, when it happened. Uh, it's mm-hmm. but I mean, little little penguins do. Uh, I mean, they cover so much of the Australian coast. They're obviously great. Um, uh, great they, gen- they, some of them, some of them even made it over to Chile. Yeah, I've yeah, met yeah. A, a a stuffed little penguin in in Chile, um, uh, and y- you know, you wonder like how we don't really know much about the southern fjords. Who knows? Well, Maybe they well, have some living well, that... little penguins down there as well. In in Chile, I mean, no. So uh, there's so much left uh, around this world we don't know. And that was really where I was going to go next. I mean, for countless thousands of years, probably, penguins had New Zealand to themselves. They had to share it with the kakapo and the kaka and the takahe and the wood hens and and whatnot uh, but then the then the maori arrived and mm-hmm. they started eating uh tawaki is that is that right they yeah were, absolutely uh, yeah, yeah. yeah probably uh, more yellow eyed well not the the pre- precessor of yellow eyed penguins they got um uh, eaten to extinction or harvested to extinction some 500 years ago and um but certainly we find um, all sorts of penguin uh, bones and mittens because it's it's a nice parcel. You know, they they come um, and you pick them up and can feed your family, you know, and um, you can transport them and trade with them. <clears throat> so <coughs> lots of communities around the world have been eating um, penguins. I, I mean, go over humble penguins um, in, in Chile. They've been eaten by a coastal community since more than 11,000 years. So, um, and you as hunters, you change the population because you pick the easy prey and the survivors are the shy ones, which means that's why we have so many extremely shy, humbled penguins. They have learned um, that people are predators that might potentially eat them. And same with Tawaki and and yellow-eyed penguins here they they were just too easy prey so they got they grew wary of people is there only one known penguin species that has been uh wiped out as a result of human uh interference in in new zealand and no there's a, a crested penguin on the chatham islands that has also been hunted to extinction okay that's not very um not very good, is it? And then no, but well, they don't reproduce fast enough. Like they're not the, the chicken that can sustain. Um, like it's it's hard to harvest penguins sustainably. I guess they are just slow breeders, and uh, like all seabirds, they live long and start breeding late, and then usually not raise many offspring. So um, it's it's not a a good species to harvest if you wanna wanna keep the population alive. I have to remember to come back to 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 this point, but um, <laughs> we've skipped already quite a few of your other I, questions. Well, we don't, don't back worry. To don't worry. It, 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 that, it's, it's part of the unique charm of the show. Uh, yes. Is, um, <laughs> the uh, so uh, after the Maori have have hunted at least one species um, to extinction, then then New Zealand was discovered. 
people discovered New Zealand. <laughs> Which is ridiculous because it already was I discovered. Yeah. I know, I know. That's why, of course, that's why I say it. It was, um, but yes, New Zealand was discovered, and and as part of that discovery, very very useful animals like mice and uh, and all sorts of rats and stoats and, and, and me, uh, yeah. Yeah, all all those really good things were were bought in. Did they? Did you ever get feral goats happening in New Zealand as well? Yeah, actually, but they get you can get rid of them relatively easily. Whereas um, stoats are so clever, they are, and and reds as well. They are so hard to get rid of, and so you end up having a sustainable harvest of reds and stoats, unfortunately, rather than really getting on top of um, their populations. So. I, I... I know I've spoken to um, Andrew Digby about about those animals and their effect on uh, kakapo and takahe, mm. but but how have they um, impacted the the penguin species and particularly uh, tawaki? Mm. They uh, actually do do even now, like we have stoats, and uh, even a single stoat can empty out um, a breeding colony. That go around and um, see stoats are so uh, such a different predator from cats. Like a cat is quite a, a careful predator, and um, doesn't have uh, nearly as much impact as the stoats. Uh, on, uh, for example, Tawaki, the a stoat would go in and on, a, on an incubating penguin go excuse me and steal an egg from underneath an incubating penguin. And um, also, for example, stoats go um, and attack prey that's maybe 10 times their size. So we've uh, got track camera, like video footage of a, a stoat. Um, once the chicks are getting left alone um, and both parents are out foraging, that you have a, like a, a good size, maybe two, two or three kilo a big chick um, on the nest, nice and fluffy, lots of fat and a neck to, to chew through. And that stoat has been riding for maybe half an hour, chewing their way through the neck to finally kill kill the chick. So they they take big big prey. Those um, those stoats there are probably uh, more a problem for um, eggs and and uh, chicks. And um, I don't know of a single incident where a stoat would attack an adult uh, penguin. They're very well uh, at defending themselves. But um, you lo lose the next generation uh, to these to these predators. So we make an effort or try, because it's it's a huge effort to stay on top of uh, um, stoat numbers. So, uh, so they're obviously having an effect. But as you as you mentioned right at the beginning of our discussion, that the numbers for Tawaki are, are greater, have proven to be greater than the estimates in the uh, in the in the seventies. So. In the nineties, yeah, <laughs> yeah, did, yeah, the 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 seventies, and then then the nineties, obviously, mm -hmm. with the the more detailed work. But are you are you confident that they are now maintaining their their population level? Or uh, no, uh, no, no. You can't really talk about population trends if you have no reliable numbers. Okay, so that yeah. Is, so that was what what I was going to get to next. Yeah. Is it because is it because we don't know, or is it because we 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 have measured a decline or an increase? It's just simply that we don't know. We we suspect um, there is an ongoing decline in some colonies, um, but the. Uh, the method uh, monitoring those colonies initially uh, was um, uh, quite flawed in looking, you know, at a plot, a stationary plot in a forest, and penguins, uh, you know, penguins move in and out these plots and find other places and decide to, uh, you know, breed around the corner. So you have to think bigger and and search a larger area, um, and then it's it's so difficult um, to even find all those nests. So we um, tried double counts where you send in two independent teams on consecutive days searching the same area and you mark nests that are found by one team and by the other team. And by that time, you, you kind of have a, like a simple mark recapture and see which nests had been found by both teams. And in and, and some areas, you have just, you know, 70 percent. Um, 
you, you only found 70% of the land and can extrapolate how many there might be in total in, in the area. But um, it's, you know, actual accurate numbers. People don't realize, you know, how hard it is to even get population oh. numbers, let alone um, population trends, and then see when you have a declining population, what are the drivers? And um, it's always easy to say, oh, it's fishing or it's predators or it, it's everything on top of each other and okay. climate change in the mix, changing the marine habitats. And so um, I'd, I'd argue we know a lot about the threats. We know they having an impact. We, we are not at the moment in, in a stage where we can reliably quantify how large that impact is. But we know um, they're have, having a hard time with all the other changes where we can't do anything about in the short term like we're not we, we're not pulling the, the the switch on on climate change anytime soon and certainly not us alone here in new zealand but what we can do locally is you know manage predators manage fisheries um and, and important foraging um areas and manage um human access to colonies for example or tell people to please not let their dogs run wild along the beach because um dogs kill penguins and so um, it's it's the accumulative um, impact rather than you, yeah. You very kindly introduced the ideas about methodology about how surveys and counts had been done in the past, mm -hmm. and then how monitoring is done now. Can you tell us about how the availability of of new technology and and uh, things like uh, geolocators, um, backpacks, mm -hmm. <laughs> camera traps, acoustic recorders, all those kind of things have have helped you uh, adapt. And, and and I'm guessing you get much better results for a much less outlay of public funding, which I'm sure you're. Uh, your, uh, Which is quite government. limited, yeah. Well, that, that's right. I'm sure the government loves to hear that. Good, we can give them less and still get more. Uh, yeah. So, t tell us how how the study of penguins has changed in New Zealand in the time that you've been involved. Uh, when when we first started, um, you know, we there were the first um, GPS trackers, for example, and they were huge breaks, and we uh, um, took them down to the Snares Islands to learn more. Back in the days, you know, we knew a lot about breeding biology, but we had no idea what happened out at sea and with foraging ecology. So um, these new um, novel technologies that allow us to uh, um, track penguins with ever smaller devices and not only uh, two-dimensional, but uh, get the dive depth and with you know if you have your phone and you turn it you know with these video games or other there's an, an accelerometer in there like a, a like a little gyroscope that can tell you um how they turn and you get essentially a three-dimensional foraging trip um and then over time um we the things got ever smaller so um with these initial bricks i i wouldn't you know uh, like Go back another 20 years when the first people in Antarctica put um, their first logger on a penguin um, just to, to see where they're going. Those Have you seen the pictures of, of you know, this, uh, with a big orange jacket? They look like a Sherpa. Like, I wonder that they even made it to the sea and then didn't straight drown straight away. Like, it was ridiculously large. And now with the technology, we're, we're talking about matchbox size loggers that have a depth sensor, a salinity sensor, um, GPS, little GPS antenna. Um, and, and they're bloody expensive too, because it's like you're throwing your laptop computer into the sea and hope the penguin won't wreck it and bring it back. Because um, that's the trouble with these loggers. You have to get them back to um, read the data. To get the and data. Can, can, can I ask you, you, you just said they're, they're hellishly expensive. For, for people who aren't in the field, what... How do you, how do you design a study like that, and what what does it cost? How many penguins do you need to put your your, your little matchbox tra um, 
recorder. I nearly called mm-hmm. it a transmitter, but it's not a transmitter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, you can have transmitters as well. They just have yeah. an antenna poking that, out. That, that's yeah. right. That's that's a different thing. So let's let let's first talk about just like the the data logger, which is not a transmitter. How how much do they cost, and how many do you need out at any one time to make a a study meaningful or or um, statistically re- uh, relevant or, mm-hmm. or, or like because because you you can't get a lot of information from just one penguin because it might be a crazy penguin and it might yeah, not be no, doing absolutely. what penguins do. Yeah, you've probably seen seen that cartoon of um, Gary um, with a uh, with a transmitter on his on his back. And some penguins going in one direction, and Gary goes into the other direction. Have that dialogue. Oh, Gary, what are you doing? Oh, some scientists put a, a tracker on my back, and I'm, yeah. I'm heading to Belgium um, to confuse them. Yeah. That's right. I'm, I'm messing with their heads. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, that, absolutely. They, 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 you have some crazy penguins, so you want a few different ones, and ideally, you want some males and some females as well. Um, so get get, and then you dream of um, eventually knowing what the juveniles are up to, but that's an entirely different story. Um, but you you're gonna be prepared to lose trackers because um, the way we uh, put them on a penguin is um, it's like w- w- essentially with teaser tape uh, on the on the um, feathers, and you want to be able to remove the logger again a week later. Uh, without damaging the feathers because they need it you don't want to damage their dive suit which means um some other like if you go for a longer distance migration you might um be prepared to glue it onto them properly and then they mold the tracker off but they gotta lock that device around all the time and and that's that's a you know, it's quite an impact on a perfectly streamlined mm-hmm. body. So um if we're working um during the breeding season um, for example, our larger cameras, we would put on only for one day. And um, the much smaller um, GPS dive data loggers, um, they carry for a, for a week. So we get su- subsequent foraging trips. Sometimes they stay out over, overnight. In extreme cases, um, or in a really poor foraging conditions, they might be away up to three um, days out and but eventually they come come back and uh, feed the chick and bring the logger back and um and in some areas like in in uh, fjordland they sometimes do even two trips a day so you get lots of trips um but quite localized and uh, you need a good um yeah a good base of data um to uh, we never have enough that's the reality mm-hmm. and we're making do of what we can fundraise um, these trackers are thousand five hundred dollars, depending on how many bells per, and whistles per per, per matchbox per, per unit. Per unit, yeah, and um, it's yeah. You just you just hope um, our cameras are more expensive. Um, just the uh, you, you just hope they bring them back, but sometimes they they uh, um, they lost. Drop- they they lose yeah. them exactly yeah. because you don't want to um, have them permanently installed. You want them installed in a way that you can remove them relatively easily again, like recapture the penguin, need five minutes, to take the logger off and let them go again about their business, like up the up the hill to feed their chicks. So um, you try to minimize that impact you're having. How how well do they adapt to being um, trapped, handled, and um and, and and fondled fondled with their scientific equipment are they uh, i mean it, it's always a, a concern there's there's all sorts of ethics about disturbing the natural behavior of 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 any animal to, in order to to study it do mm-hmm. they adapt well to it and uh, and and actually here's the next question too i'll throw <laughs> and I haven't even answered all my no, funding wishes. No, I well, thought I would well, hold up a list well, and say, I well, want this one. Well, 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 <laughs> but we, now we are on the next thing. Well, we, we, well, we'll, oh, okay, we'll, we'll go you. back to it. But but th- this question sort of is is really relevant, thankfully, yeah. that uh, they're quite long-lived birds. So how, yeah. how, long, how long, on average, uh, can a pair of uh, tawaki live and then – the the link really is how many times will do you think they might be handled if they're in a uh, a, a well studied um, colony or population? 
<laughs> we like we, we don't have well studied areas quite yet. Oh, we're, <laughs> we're, we're just starting with the Tawaki. But we know a lot about um, the Hoiho, the yellow eyed penguin. And um, the oldest penguin I've come across that was still breeding uh, was 25 years. And you could see like an old dogs. You sometimes see these yeah, kind of yeah. getting the gray the, face. The, and, yeah, you know, these well, eyebrows. Well, I, I know about that. Then. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that penguin, um, yeah, certainly looked look quite old. And, it, uh, you know, I, I don't I haven't seen it again, but um, they can. I think they, they would Tawaki. I'd, I'd, if I had to guess that there will be some in the wild, and I've seen some really old penguins, but they were not marked. But, you know, like males with a huge honker and that, that beak uh, continues to grow and, and quite gray in the, in the, like, uh, in the face, in the top face saying that because juveniles look super old like if you're one year and you have a gray beard and and you, you look like you've you've you're done for life you know and <laughs> they look they look so old and yet they just survived their first year or must have been a really hard year and then they mold into the pretty um adult plumage and look nice and shiny and young again um wish we could do that grant actually yeah that's <laughs> right but, but that uh... That's a, that's a really good factoid that I didn't know, but I, mm. and I'm going to assume that it's um, common across penguins that it their bill continues to increase in size. Their bill is not like um, uh, other other features like other bones that once they reach a a, a mature um, age that that's how big they they are, but mm -hmm. their bill just continues to what thicken. Uh, and, and become like the antlers of a uh, of a deer. What a shock! It, it, How can you compare it? it? Well, that that, yes. the, that this thing grows grows. Of course, the the deer molt them off, but oh, it's probably mm. more cattle cattle's horns oh, or something. <laughs> um, but do, do you think that a big bill is like? like a really nice tail for a bird of paradise like is that yeah yeah you no yeah. no not at all they're they're just the hunker um to defend their territory so you have different sizes like penguin like people always look at penguins and think males and females look the same and they don't like once you work with them the male the male is like in, in tawaki is a killer heavier has a much chunkier bill just to start with <clears throat> so even a juvenile male can have a huge bill and there's always you know some size difference they're very minute females and some that are, are quite bulky and almost as strong um, as a male and you can have pairs where the female actually is slightly larger um than their male but uh, in general the male is quite large yeah they 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 need to defend the territory and a big honker helps them and you know they have this nice hook that they, they, they draw blood, um, you know, you need to know how to, to handle them if you want to attach a logger, but they, they have a hook and as they, they use it, it, of course it needs to to grow and, and be, you know, it's just like their toenails, you know, they are, are our fingernails, things just grow and They're get replaced as you, as you use fair. them up. And that's a big trouble actually with um, some zoo penguins that don't have enough to work off their beaks then they get this overgrown, funny, um, uh, sometimes crossbill um, beaks that that just um, yeah, or uh, hoofs or something. Um, you need to maintain a wild horse running up some some crazy scree fields will work their hoofs much more than uh, a horse on a paddock. So um, so it is. It's not not growing, you know, quite as fast, but it's certainly um there's a trend that <clears throat> older birds often have bigger bills so, and that's just like uh, it's it, we don't have um and we're still um we just started to mark birds so for tawaki it's a gut feeling a lot what i what i say i don't have the hard data quite yet um because we're just now we, if you mark an old bird you don't know how old it is you know it's adult and then you can follow it through and and see it a couple of years later again raising an, a successful um a, a chick and say oh you look bigger mate you had a really and and bigger in terms of they grow twice as fat just in preparation for the mold as you know 
So um, they go through very big phases and quite slender phases um, with the breastbone poking out after mold if they, they had a, a hard season. But that, that beak, you know, you can always tell whether it's a male or female because that honker is really standing out. And I can send you a few cool pair pictures. Always love penguin <laughs> pictures and, and, yeah. and being able to share share them around. Uh, you, we we were talking about uh, about the cost of 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 that particular data logger, and I'm I'm guessing that the transmitters are probably a bit more expensive, and it costs a lot of money to have people in the field. Person hours is is usually the largest cost of any mm -hmm. kind of project, and you said the word fundraising. So, Tawaki project is fundraising. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, of course, always, um, because uh, we we are running that project on the smell of an oily rag and with lots of passion. So um, you imagine even getting into these remote fjord areas, we are piggybacking on, on a fantastic um, support by, by local businesses. Southern Discoveries have taken us under their wings and um, provide us with uh, free um, boat rides and we can use their kayaks to get to breeding colonies. And uh, further south in the fjords, we were collaborating with fjord Fjordland expeditions. On the west coast, we have um, the Greenstone helicopters that allow us to hitch rides out to those colonies. So logistics is a, is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. And we are absolutely grateful for um, that, that big community that's on board and helping us and supporting us in the field. Because, you know, as, as I, I told you earlier, uh, it's really hard to get um, governmental funding for any long term project. You, you you know in science you want these these quick um quick uh, sexy projects and not following things through you know varied marine environments and over many seasons and, which is one um, of the one of the structural like, problems isn't it it's a real structural <laughs> problem with finding uh quality uh long quality research and that and mm -hmm. and that people like yourself have to design studies that may not be the studies that you want to do simply because it's the only way that you can get anything funded. Is that a fair a fair comment? Yeah, it's like you've got to make do what with what you have. And uh, anything we're learning about them is more than we knew before. But in an ideal world, you would have more devices and you would have more people in the field and you'd ideally have um, be able, because currently most of the people in the field last actually last um last season we didn't have anybody mm. on a salary like we've been all including myself working for free and our time off in order to get that sort of data um and i have really skilled great people um that that um, work with us since a long time and i would wish i could offer them a salary but at the moment, uh, we can't, and they're still on board and still passionate. And uh, but I think conservation suffers from always assuming that people work with passion and for free, and somehow they gotta feed themselves as well. And that's one of the great problems, isn't it, about conservation? Because you know, we we I'm I'm associating myself uh, <laughs> just because I, I sit here and do things for no pay, but but I'm not. It's not. You know, I'm not. I'm not a scientist, right? You guys are, are increasingly expected to do things without pay, but mm. but you don't get people in other parts of government and the community being expected to do their core work for no pay. Like like the government doesn't say we're building roads, we're going to build this great <laughs> new highway. But nobody who drives a truck is actually going to be paid their full wage. We're going to pay them ten percent uh, of of the value of their output. I mean that that just doesn't happen. But in science, it seems to be accepted because we're, you're all doing good work. Um, it's one of the things I I really hope can have a small impact in changing. I don't think people know actually understand that. Tawaki project is something you do, but it's not what you do for your for job. Money. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's an expensive hobby. Yeah. Yeah. So, let, well, let's talk about Tawaki project. 
Who who's involved? Tell us a little bit about the team, and mm-hmm. then let let's recognise the people who are supporting you. And and it, are there any formal affiliations with universities or other bodies as well? Just, just run us through oh, how it's there's, done. There's, yeah, there's there's plenty of um, formal um, associations. Well, we started the Tawaki project um, well back in the day. The first recce trip was. Um, um, almost 20 years ago now, in 2003, out to Brexy Island. That's when I saw my first Tawaki together uh, with my partner, Thomas. And um, we always wanted to know more about them because there's so little known about uh, Tawaki. And it, it needed another 10 years, actually. Um, and um, the opportunity, I had the opportunity, because in my uh, spare time, <laughs> like for, for a job, I, I uh, work as a um, scientific consultant and um, also um, I'm affiliated with Otago University at the moment, um, doing uh, lots of teaching. And that's a whole different different story again, like trying to, to have uh, maintain face-to-face teaching under RET. But um, we started and I did a contract for DOC um, working across several different conservancies that didn't normally talk to each other on the West Coast and Fjordland and the Southern Islands. And we suddenly realized, hey, and this is an opportunity. We have all the key players here on the table um, and they're all interested in Tawaki. Let's start a project where we learn more about Tawaki, learn more about um, how many there might be um, their breeding biology um, in, in the different areas, their breeding success and especially their their foraging ecology their marine ecology what they're doing out at sea because we had no clue what what happened with them and so we started um very little and um with uh, a bunch of international um friends actually because you know in the seabird community you, you know people and new zealand is exotic enough that you go Hey, you know, Clemens from overseas, um, uh, Clemens Pitts, the director of the Antarctic Research um, Trust, for example, he came over and brought some some devices, some satellite trackers for us um, to put on penguins and other people, especially important, the Global Penguin Society. Um, Pablo Garcia Boburoglu is our contact. He's Argentinian um, and works closely with the University of Washington. So, um, there's lots of people um, around the world, a, um, a good colleague from Cape Town working for Suncop, for example, came over and helped. So we have a, a team of keen scientists that came in their spare time, come over and um, to, to help with a Tawaki project. And um, then we have a bunch of really cool um, students and community uh, workers that that just uh, say okay I, I make time for a week or two to help you out uh, during the breeding season and we had um, last season um, I mentioned Robin Long before um, she yeah she's fantastic she's been with us almost since the beginning since many years now and um, uh, then we have some that uh, come back um, or, uh, for example GIS specialist from Christchurch Lindsay Chan was with us in the field um, last season, we have very keen um, students um, at the moment. We have Jeff White, who's doing a PhD. He used to do a master's with us, and he just started his PhD, now expanding south into into um, the other fjords. He worked in Doubtful last season. Um, uh, he's based in Miami. And um, then we have, and oh, and we just got featured yesterday, in fact, um, on the, if you pull up University of Miami, the main web page, um, you'll see my photo of a Tawaki and a chick, curious chick kind of looking around that. Um, uh, it, it's pretty cool, like uh, featured on that, that web page with a direct link to the Tawaki project. Um, but um, I, I want to mention Blake Hornblow as well. He is our master student um, and he um, did really great work together with Jeff and, and Duffel Sun this year. So. There are students coming and putting putting their enthusiasm and, and their heart into the project. And uh, we have s- uh, lots of international scientists that uh, that look, yeah, including, for example, um, Tom Hart, you might have heard uh, from Penguin Watch, um, who said, I have a few spare track cameras. Do you want them um, to monitor Tawaki um, nests? So it's, it's coming as a, it's a puzzle of enthusiastic people and gear um, and uh, big dreams, um, but yeah, slowly, slowly, 
we're, we're heading the right direction and uh, starting to know more and more about our elusive um, forest penguin. I'm really encouraged that there is that sharing of expensive gear um, risky. between between people. <laughs> well, it well it, well it is risky. People need yeah, to recognise that that it, mm -hmm. that it, that it's a gamble because. But but in the southern hemisphere, there's the on season that it might be the off season in another part of the world, mm -hmm. and that gear is is always being used and not sitting in a cupboard for for three or four years, uh, three or four months at a time. So, yeah. Uh, but the so, problem is hey, with, with satellite trackers, and in that particular case, you put them on for the winter migration or the pre-mold migration, and they're gone. And the chance that you ever get them back, get is, them back is, is remote. So, yeah, you're, so you're, you're putting them on for a one-off. And in fact, I think I got, oh, actually, I think I got maybe, maybe four or five back from the 20 we deployed so um it's you know it's for the greater good we want to learn more about them we um need to publish more papers we're that's also a spare time job you know uh, that's uh, once job is done and you have some money and food on the table you go at night and fire up the computer again and write a write a paper yeah, that, <laughs> and, that's right and i'm not publishing as fast as i would like to but um <laughs> they are all on board so they'll be co-authors uh, in these scientific publications and so that's kind of um the pay and plus the excitement and and enthusiasm that we actually we are learning new stuff we are at you know that's what science is about we we want to discover stuff we don't know yet and not just anything but stuff that can inform uh, a better um, conservation strategy and it's really great you mentioned you've got local businesses that operate in the uh, in the region in the broader region that are helping you out because getting into remote locations and spending time there right. and move, <laughs> moving from location to location mm -hmm. is yeah. wildly expensive so um, we we really need to congratulate those businesses for being involved and They're fantastic and, and, and please, bird people, if you are going to New Zealand, you need to look up uh, these businesses. Ursula, he, here's your opportunity to to <laughs> let people know where where they where they can book their tours or their helicopter yeah. flights. Who should they choose? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Southern Discoveries um, in Milford Sound have been hugely hugely helpful, and if you have the chance, they have the underwater observatory in Harrison Cove. So that at that two year tour. And have a look, go down into the fjord and uh, become a part of the fjord environment, see black coral and other crazy things that you can't see anywhere in the world. So Southern Discoveries, um, certainly Fjordland Expeditions, Abu and Mandy down in the Southern Fjords, they do really cool tours. And they're one of several businesses that, um, yeah, that, that are uh, helping, but they're probably the core. Um, and I, and I really want to um, shout out to uh, the Greenstone helicopters on the on the west coast. Without um, uh, those guys, we would have never started working in these remote west coast locations. So it's much appreciated. Yeah, we couldn't do that stuff without you. There we are. Big thumb, <laughs> big thumbs up for all of you because uh, obviously they're. They're oh, making... I really important, Grant. I almost forgot because with COVID, you can imagine. Currently, um, boat tours, you know, without tourists, there's just a fraction of the boats. And we started to do a lot more of our work with kayaks, kayaking to these remote colony locations. So Roscoe's kayaks and Milford Sound came on board with these beautiful big sea kayaks and allowed us to take them out to the fjord entrance and land in crazy places where um, it's a bit challenging and a bit swell and we would be gone for a few days before we bring those kayaks back and we're really appreciating um having having access to those kayaks and thus those remote colonies Fantastic. good on you roscoe <laughs> yes <laughs> right? so yeah and and i uh, i mean i can't endorse any of these businesses because i haven't used any of them yet but mm. i would encourage you to if you're making a selection uh, if you're going to New Zealand and doing tours, um, look them all up and and uh, and remember making your choice that these are people who are obviously committed to the cause because they're supporting the cause with their real dollars. 
Mm. Uh, And conservation minded. Yeah. That's right. So it's important to uh, support our fellow travellers. So, so do that. Um, Ursula, is there anything that I have neglected to bring up in in the discussion about Tawaki and and penguins in New Zealand? I'm sure there is. So what there, comes to mind? We, we, could, <laughs> we could talk for for a few more hours, I think. And in no. fact, when you first approached me, you said we we're gonna expand to seabirds in general because New Zealand is the seabird yeah. capital of the world, and we have so many. So many endemic species, nobody else has. Um, so, um, and most of them are in, in, in dire straits. So, and most of them are very poorly researched. So, we have a lot of work ahead of us to learn more about our seabirds um, here in New Zealand, and hopefully find um, the right ways to um, provide. I, I'm a scientist, so I want to provide data and be able to communicate the data that makes better outcomes for um, for birds. In New Zealand, and um, since I'm a seabird nerd, um, that's what I, I'd pledge for, uh, guys. We we need to learn more about our seabirds, but even the seabirds we know a lot about, like the yellow penguins, um, they need a lot more help um, to even survive the next few decades here on the mainland. So we are about, and since this is the bird emergency podcast, we talked about tawaki that are doing quite great. And for me, it's kind of soul food to go out and they see them successfully raising their chicks. We have other penguins, especially the yellow-eyed penguin, that is struggling severely. And at the current projection, like we did some population modeling, and its trajectory is currently, the actual numbers we're counting is lower than the worst case um, population modeling forecast. So we are on track to lose them in the next couple of decades if we are not getting our act together. That sounds like there's a whole other podcast episode to talk yes, about, huge. particularly yes. there. <laughs> um, I mean, I, uh, I I approached you about Tawaki because I found the fantastic website, which, uh, well, let's get that plug in there, Tawaki, yes. tawaki-project.org. That's where you'll find that. So yes. just in case we forget later on. Now, um, you mentioned you're a, you're a seabird nerd, and New Zealand is the capital, the world capital of seabirds. I think. Did you did you see the um, the the talk on Twitter uh, a week or so back that a New Zealand storm petrel was was seen on a um, offshore bird watching trip in Tasmania no no I've missed that but so, um, that is really cool they like storm petrels are crazy like they they um, I've seen them I had the opportunity to work my way um, as a student work my way back from New Zealand um, back to Europe um, six weeks you know and the ship was so big that it didn't fit the Panama Canal so we had to go around Cape Horn and the Cap Verdes and Falkland you know it was uh, oh, quite an experience oh, like bummer. I had, what an inconvenience. Yes, oh. I saw so many cool birds. I, I yet have to go back to the Falkland Islands. Um, but I've seen um, storm petrels, like in 10 meter waves, crazy, just dancing around, doing their thing. And and you're in this big ship. And that made me, I, I, before that, I, I tell you, I didn't know what bad weather was. So we have like uh, Force 11 from behind. And and the these, this big ship was surfing. Um, was surfing on the waves and and you think of Shackleton and their small little boats and you go like how the hell did they ever survive that and there are these handful of tiny fragile little storm petrels dancing on the waves and doing the thing and and just um co- completely unfaced um of, of this crazy storm that made kind of crazy waves like we had a 40 meter high bridge and the waves smashed into us like it was insane these roaring 40s and 50s to experience the, the sheer force of of the sea and then realizing there's birds out there that are you know so little and yet so capable and um, survivors real survivors so if you ever feel small and down and and thinking um, how will you really deal with the next few days ahead think of these storm petrels that just cope that's right i i really need to do more on storm petrels uh, and and shear waters they're they're yeah amazing. oh they're amazing long-term travelers they're absolutely stunning grant I mean, we... have you ever oh no 
I let you go. Do you want to wrap uh, up? Or? No, 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 no. I, w- I was just going to say there's World Albatross Day, but there's not World Storm Petrol Day. So No. Now, what, what were you going to say? Oh, um, I'm, I'm just absolutely amazed. Um, when, you, when you stand ashore and see those fragile little birds zooming past and then you imagine like it's really this this sort of freedom they they pull you out and our sh- like sooty shear waters for example who we still they have they nest in, in the millions around uh, new zealand on the uh, mostly on the predator free islands like yeah they're all struggling with with uh, new zealand must have looked so differently a couple hundred years ago mm. anyway but they take off and they go all the way up you know to to um, the Arctic and then I zoom back around and uh, you have other birds, you know, regularly going over to Chile or even during the breeding season, Cook's petrels go down to Antarctica and back and and they're tiny and um, just these huge ocean ocean wanderers um, that that live in both worlds basically. They can fly for days with very little effort, but yet you know, um, or the sooty shear waters I just mentioned. They're amazingly um, adapted for diving as well. So they plunge and dive down 30, 40 meters, 50 meters sometimes uh, deeper than our little penguins. Um, and uh, mind you, like a proper penguin, uh, like the Tawaki goes more than 100 meters or yellow penguin more than 150 meters if they want to. But um, uh, like having a flying bird being able to dive uh, uh, like like shearwaters, uh, yet, yet another really a mind-boggling thing i think like there's so much um we still need to appreciate and learn about seabirds uh, around this world and um they, they're inspiring it's it's really great how much more aware people are of seabirds but we still know uh, generally as a community we we generally right. know nothing about seabirds mm-hmm. and and shorebirds for for that instance, but mm. but hey, we're we're chipping away bit by bit and bringing mm-hmm. bringing them out out from under the cloak of mystery, or it's almost a cloak of invisibility, isn't it? For particularly for things like storm petrels. I mean, I mm. think I think the general public is pretty aware about shearwaters because we know about mutton birds, and mm. I certainly certainly at primary school learnt about the amazing wedge-tailed shearwater journey mm-hmm. around the world, and oh, then perfect. you find out. And then you find, gee, most of the birds do something like that, but we yeah, just didn't crazy. know. And like, and, like those little Arctic turns, you know, going in full, full circle almost. Yeah, it's, uh, it's flying amazing. to the moon during their lifetime. Yeah, that's right. It's amazing. It's amazing. All right, let's um, uh, uh, let, let's let's tackle the um, uh, the bird emergency questions, Ursula. Are, are okay. you ready? I, I don't know. I don't know what you're going to throw at me, so good, I probably should good. have actually. Then, then, <laughs> then, we, then we don't get a rehearsed uh, answer. Now, okay. Now you travelled to uh, many locations looking at mm-hmm. at birds, but so we'll have to break this into two questions. When you're in New Zealand and you're just out out in the in the field, what field guide do you take with you? I don't oh. think you need one for penguins, but but for 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 general birding, what do you what do you use to identify your New Zealand birds? You, to um, tell your tom tit from a tui. <laughs> See, the the thing is, the the we have so few terrestrial birds here um, that general seabird guides are um, what I would use on on a, you know the Harrison on a on a ship, but if I'd go um, you know just somewhere in the fjordland and want to want to look in fact if i if i have internet access i am very much like new zealand birds online because there you have like these little sound snippets and you can have the calls and yeah yeah, and and uh, you have all the different because there's different dialects depending on where you are and um it's just fun to explore and i've i've also contributed i've uh, written the little uh, blurb about the tawaki in in the new zealand birds online um um, web page, so check that out. But it, um, it's it's a really good resource. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. No, I absolutely love that. Um, but if you insist on a book that you wanna wanna take, you know, um, see, books are always so heavy. Like I, um, I, I'm a lot in a backpack, so I, I don't 
often take books into the field, I must admit. I have my little diary and then I, I take pictures if I get confused and come back and figure out stuff later, especially getting all my, my fish and other crazy or, um, you know, my botany right. Yeah. But um, the, the Heather and Robertson, I think, is the standard bird guide uh, I'd recommend for people um, that just come to New Zealand and uh, want to learn uh, more about uh, New Zealand birds. Okay. But T title, title is, is, has it got a good title like the birds of New Zealand? Uh, it's just birds, I think. Birds, <laughs> birds, birds. <laughs> I'm not even sure. Is there any that I? There's got to be probably birds of New Zealand. You're right. There's got to be yeah. New Zealand somewhere in the title. Yeah. But, I, I, um, I was going to say you, you, that would be a good one to go shopping for in the bookshop. Birds. I'd, li <laughs> I'd, I'd like the book called Birds, and they'd go what yes. birds of. <laughs> Birds of New Zealand, Without birds the of the forest, birds. Without the extubated yeah. version of that's one. That's right, one. that's right. The expurgated version. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry if if, yeah. if you don't know if you don't know about Monty Python, that last bit made no sense to you whatsoever. And if you do know about Monty Python, you are reciting the rest of the skit, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ursula. Well, well, we, we've almost worked out the next question. It's not going. It's not going to plan. So, I'm I'm guessing that your your phone is like your must have piece of kit for the for the field, or is yeah. it your notebook? I, you know, uh, the phone. I have a little database in there um, where I record, you know, nest checks and everything. Um, so, um, and, and, to, and then you 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 just press sync and it's in the cloud and you That's don't right. have and to then... worry about transcribing and you know with transponders you just scan the number and you have it and else you have like this i don't know 15 digit transponder number that's so error prone like back in the days when i started i've been writing bent numbers in in these waterproof field books and then you go back and say you're, you're not even a yellow-eyed penguin you're a, some crazy other thing banded on some southern arctic islands where where's my number you know a twist and you go back through the database and try to figure out what you've, you've got to work out what er what area you might you made yeah, with your exactly. china and graph now, petrol Pe yeah and pencil. now these days yeah. you, you run around the forest like with a transponder gun um yeah. for like these big things you use for, yeah. for cows usually but you can yeah can kind of sneak up and often read, read birds like yeah. uh, now they have just like um, cats and, and dogs, they have yeah. a little transponder ship in their neck. And yeah. as you sneak up, you kind of kind of poke around the corner and go zip of like a meter or so di distance. And then you have the idea of the bird attending the nest and it's straight in, in your database and you don't need to worry about transcription errors um, unless uh, unless you drop your phone into the sea, which has happened as well, but yeah, um, sure. you try to avoid that. <laughs> yeah. and, and of course, you know we're we're not following the script. Uh, that gives an insight into what I really wanted to talk about a bit more about the methods of of retrieving data that is uh, far less stressful than it than it used to be. You don't actually need to handle the birds to download the data off of some no, of these devices which is uh, which is great mm -hmm. um, no. what's your bucket list location where you haven't been where let let's give you the option you can go to you can mm. go to watch any any birds or you can pick a seabird seabirding location but where where's somewhere that you you're leaning back in your chair dreaming Oh, I'd love to go to see the curlews nesting in Siberia or what? How oh, funny! Where, How where, do you yeah. know? Like, I have, I have a, yeah, I've I've been working as a backcountry guide in the Norwegian Arctic and spent quite some time and had opportunity to work in in the Siberian um, uh, in Yamal Peninsula in in particular, but I'm I'm so dreaming of going further east. And um, Kamchatka is a place uh, that was always on my list and I've never managed to get there. And so there's, but there's so many places around the world. I'd, I'd love the opportunity to uh, work actually, because I, I don't think I just want to travel. I want to contribute and yeah. I want yeah. to be part of a project. And then, um, you know, we, for example, in Siberia, we worked on scoters and long-tailed ducks and, and other, other seabirds, but um, there's all these other crazy birds that you then kind of pick up along the way and be really happy about. So 
it's it's always you know you're out there and with open eyes and um you i'm not a ticker as such i i really enjoy um seeing birds uh and be, you know seeing them behave in their natural mm -hmm. environment not just go it was tick i got you know my life list now is 400 something um it's it's more about actually spending time with them and seeing what they're doing so yeah spending some time in some really cool areas in Siberia and Kamchatka I'd love to go back to Canada I had a year there um but it's not nearly long enough um so there's there's lots of places I'd like to go back and visit and um certainly down in Patagonia like I'm, I'm you, you mentioned like I'm I'm a bit attracted to those um rougher areas of the globe you know sea and mountains and um uh, not so nice weather um but yeah so uh, I hope um, we have a seabird project kicking off in, in Chile that I'll have some more time um, spending down around those southern shores as well. So, fingers well, crossed. Well, <laughs> well, well, dear listener, if you're a regular listener to the show, you will know that Ursula, in that answer, actually covered a couple of the uh, the next questions. So that was really good. Oh, and, no. and, 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 <laughs> and 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 there's there's obviously so much more to to talk to you about in in your career and and where where you've uh, where you've been. But we'll have to do that uh, another time. But you're going to have to tell me now what's your bucket list bird. Ah, oh, oh, that's too hard. Oh man. If I'd I'm, known. Well, if, I, if, if you'd known, you would have had an answer just there and it wouldn't have been half as much fun. Yeah. Oh. See, because it's always hard to just narrow it down on that one bird. Something achievable Something. and yeah. close. It's I haven't seen a New Zealand stone federal yet. Can you okay. believe that? Uh, so well, 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 I can because yeah. an, uh, an, unless you're heading up to the... Uh, up to the Gulf the on the Gulf, North yeah. Island regularly, you're not going to, you know, that's where they hang out most. But mm. otherwise, it's going to be a chance sighting because they, they just, they even, you know, <laughs> they just disperse. They just yeah. go. Yeah, uh, and they're yeah. tiny and easily missed. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think, have. I to... think that's a good choice. I think yeah. that's a good choice. So, the, but the hardest question is coming up. Oh no. What's harder still. Yeah, harder still. This is the hardest question. Mm -hmm. What? What's the best bird? There's no best bird. Ah, best bird. correct, no. correct, <laughs> correct. There is no best bird. Every bird is the best bird. Thank oh, you very God. much for that. <laughs> yes. All right. What's the best penguin? There we go. Uh, see, like I'm biased, so I'm really in love with those crested penguins, and I particularly like Tawaki. Um, but I'm looking forward to spending more time with erect cresteds as well. I know very little about those, so maybe in a in a years or two time, so you, you'll find me just um, you know, bragging about how beautiful uh, erect crested penguins are. But currently, Tawaki, they have my heart. What can I what can I say? But back they, to your best bird thing, you know, there's some birds that are best at certain things and others are best at other things. And uh, like I, I absolutely love, for example, the Atlantic puffins, because that's kind of the seabird that got me into, into being, um, uh, chasing seabirds when I was nine and just coming along like um, around uh, Norway and uh, kayaking in the Lofoten Islands. And as you come closer to those seabird islands they're like like beehives you know and you see like all these uh, birds zooming around and you come closer and then they kind of you have these cliff nesting seabirds that are all black and white and not very interesting for a little girl and then you have the puffins and they just caught me and i absolutely fell in love and um just then we had a um a sea eagle swooping past and grabbing a puffin out of the air but because we are there human disturbance it got distracted and dropped it almost into my lap. So I, I had him, you know, straight away uh, dead then, a very unhappy puffin, and I felt for it. But that was kind of the the first connection and seeing all the combinations of, you know, birds do what birds do to stay alive. And um, they're all beautiful. 
I'm I'm sure the orcs and the guillemots are really, really, really happy with your description of the just the black and white birds. <laughs> so you could apply it to penguins and people got really target hate mail. Oh no. I oh, oh no, I oh know. But bird nerd hate mail. We don't want any of that. No, please um, don't. <laughs> Ursula, I, I I hope you'll speak to me again sometime where we maybe we can talk about uh those Early years in the in the northern <laughs> hemisphere, learning about seabirds. Um, uh, listeners will will probably, hopefully, be happy to know that twenty first of February. Um, hopefully, I've got this out by then, Ursula. If not, it's revisionist. Um, <laughs> but starting starting on the twenty first of February, we'll be back to Monday megaphones, where we have a sort of panel panel discussion about issues in mm -hmm. conservation and birds and whatnot. So that would be a a bit like Desert Island Discs, um, but with birds, and we can uh, maybe talk about uh, your your career and how you ended up in New Zealand, perhaps. Um, well, it's uh, the seabed capital. Where else could I be? That's right. That's <laughs> right. And uh, so it, it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, Ursula Allenberg, in Dunedin, in New Zealand, thanks so much for joining me on the Bird Emergency talking about the amazing Tawaki penguin. There's going to be lots of information and Ursula is going to... Um, send me some lovely visuals that we can uh, we can put in oh. there, so you can learn more about Tawaki. And of course, Tawaki-project.org is where you will find everything about Tawaki. And there's some great resources about penguins in New Zealand generally. If you if you search, actually, you mentioned that you're on Twitter. If people want to okay. check out check out your your timeline and perhaps some real time updates on on what you're seeing or, mm -hmm. or hearing about, what's yes, your please. what's your Twitter handle? It's it's at u l n b e r g. It's um, the shortest I could think of. So, <laughs> very good, very because good. Because you don't want to waste characters. You know, I'm I'm old Twitter, so where you had very limited characters. So it's at u l N B E R G, and I must admit I'm not spending nearly enough time uh, on Twitter. I really enjoy catching up um, on a weekend, but when I'm in the field and have reception, I'd tweet some some crazy fieldwork pics and yeah. But well, that, it's it's very occasional. You you don't yeah. get um, swamped with you know information. Yeah, no, that, well, that's like un, uh, unlike my Twitter feed. <laughs> yes. Your yours is always impactful and important when uh, when there's something out there. So that's great. Usually uh, pictures, yeah. Yeah, no, and 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 that's all. That always makes Twitter fun. Um, uh, uh, Ursula, I, I often repeat this, but uh, but do you know that there's a bird nerd in New Zealand who has the best Twitter handle that there possibly could be? Uh, tell me. Uh, well, um, I'm assuming you you are acquainted with Steph Burrell. Yes, absolutely. And do you know her Twitter handle? Um, I have it in my um, Twitter line. Um, yeah, but I can't remember her handle at the moment. No. Petrol station. Oh, true. And yes, and I yes, petrol station. And then, and uh, I remember back in the days, I thought like, why would you have station there? Yeah. But yeah. And then and, and, and then you realise that that's what that's what we call them everywhere. Like we're going down the petrol station. Um, yes. <laughs> So yeah, so there we go. Steph, Steph still is the winner of Twitter, in my opinion. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, we've done the goodbyes, but let's do them again. Thanks, Ursula. Um, I'm Grant Williams. This is the Bird Emergency. That's Ursula Allenberg talking to us from New Zealand. I hope you've enjoyed our little chat about penguins. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>